That's it. Here you go. Okay, okay. you're seeing my screen. Is that everything is okay? Yeah. On your hand? Yeah. Okay. Cool. Perfect. So my face is on screen now. Is that correct? <laughs> yes. <it is. laughs> okay. Good. So welcome everybody. Um, this is um, a sort of uh, talk in between uh, two extremes uh, of this uh, crazy world, uh, crazy technology world. On one hand, uh, it is uh, about uh, plain crude, create, read, update, and delete. So plain uh, uh, SQL Server, plain data access, uh, uh, but with uh, an extra element, uh, history. And this uh, extra addition, this uh, the history part, uh, the history addition to crude, uh, starts uh, finding its foundation in something very cool. This, this is the other extreme of plain data access, which is artificial uh, intelligence, it has to do with uh, big data, and has to do ultimately to uh, business events, business uh, events that we observe in the domain, in the business domain, that we write uh, applications for. So let me start from uh, a tweet that I made uh, a few months ago um, during a regular, plain, uh, uh, traditional, I would say, conference. Uh, uh, I was supposed to talk about uh, maybe something like ASP.NET Core. I don't even remember exactly what, but. Uh, and uh, during the keynote uh, of that conference uh, somewhere in Europe, uh, I got an inspiration uh, from what the speaker, uh, the keynote speaker said about artificial intelligence, it would be so cool, uh, the services we're getting from Microsoft being so powerful, so enthusiastic, and this and this and this. So uh, that inspired me to think that the thought that you see on screen, uh, uh, far before artificial intelligence, uh, let me say we need intelligence, and far before uh, deep learning, uh, and far before uh, big data, we need some software architecture that can collect big data. Uh, personally, these days I'm trying to do, I'm starting to do, uh, quite a bit of work with uh, artificial intelligence, neural networks in particular. So I'm studying a little bit the theory behind the neural networks, which is uh, a completely different world from the perception that we're having through uh, the wonderful uh, services, the wonderful tools that Microsoft, for example, but not just Microsoft, is offering through Azure, uh, things like a cognitive services, the bot framework, and things like that. Those are primarily tools. They're, those are things like the, the plain uh, screwdriver we can use to make uh, some, uh, some, uh, some works around the house. Uh, what is the real change or the real opportunity we are facing is in modeling data, in modeling the domain, so that with the architecture itself for the software, regardless of the platform, can produce uh, big data. Let me uh, try to reinforce the concept uh, about uh, the relevance of big data for any application with um, with an example. Imagine uh, uh, a conversation, and actually this is a real conversation that I heard. There was a question that a teacher asked to a couple of students, so why would you like to study medicine? And uh, the answer was because we want to defend mankind we want to save the humanity, we want to defend mankind from all diseases. This is a wonderful, noble uh, goal, but the teacher surprisingly said, okay, if this is what you want to do in your life, you have to study computer science then, not medicine. How is that possible? I mean, it sounds like a, a total a counter sense. It makes no sense at all. But the teacher was actually a researcher fighting cancer in the real world and he said as a cancer researcher all I do every day is analytics on big data. So this demonstrates and again this is a real world this shows that today some aspects of science uh, uh, even science like medicine is uh, 
totally dependent on big data and the work that re cancer researchers actually do is recognizing algorithmically patterns in the way that the big data collected from the behavior of molecules in the body determine the evolution of cancer. So big data is, of course, critical and it's critical well beyond the marketing gimmicks, the hype we hear, oh, the future is on big data. Big data is in just every application. So my next question is, okay, guys, where is your big data? Eh, big data lives underneath the data of the application. And now, let's uh, stop for a few seconds thinking about what happens in a traditional standard legacy application based on uh, some sort of uh, SQL database. Every time we update an existing table record, we are automatically, irreversibly losing track of the state that record had before. Okay, you can say we have backup copies, but again, it's the same kind of story. Because, uh, again, every time you update a record, unless you maintain a backup copy of the table for every single update you perform, at some point you lose information. So making an update to any single table record determines losing some information. Now, um, especially if you live in Europe, but not just if you live in Europe, you may have heard about something called the GDPR, which is a, a new EU, European Union uh, regulation, uh, which will be enforced uh, next May, May 2018. Um, it has to do with, uh, with privacy and uh, data privacy, and it brings uh, in it raises the issue for every single web application, every single application actually, and every company holding data on behalf of users to apply a number of uh, uh, changes uh, to the process. And in particular, GDPR claims that every software application should be able to track all processing being done on data. So every single update must be tracked and in a way justified because GDPR states uh, at some point you might face uh, as uh, the owner of data for the company, uh, you, you might be requested by users uh, justification about uh, the use that your software has made of the private data. So. Again, this point that just reinforces the point that every time we update a record, we are losing track of the state it had before, and that state is lost forever. It cannot be set back. Data, more in general, is uh, <clears throat> the most uh, uh, valuable asset of every company. I'm stating the obvious. I recognize, yes, that's right. I'm totally stating the obvious here. Data is the most valuable asset of every company and it is uh, the, also the input of any business intelligence process. Uh, it's so easy to hear about, uh, also to talk about uh, business intelligence, how relevant it is for business, how cool it is, uh, how rewarding it could be for certain companies, how crucial for others, and what blah, blah, blah. It's just words. Business intelligence is, uh, has been for a few years and will be in the future uh, just uh, uh, a hot topic, a hot buzzwords. But uh, you cannot do significantly any BI if you don't have data. And the data must be tailor made for BI. And the combination of data and BI processes is ultimately uh, one way to look at artificial intelligence. So, uh, uh, no, you, you are not attending the wrong talk. So even though so far, and it's been about 10 minutes, I've been uh, talking about artificial intelligence, <coughs> even though 
I was uh, mentioning uh, big data, uh, BI. Uh, I'm still about going to talk in the rest of the time about CRUD, about SQL Server, about Entity Framework, about Data Access. So this is not the wrong talk. I'm just trying to illustrate why history plus CRUD is crucial for just every application because it can start and doing, it can start showing the way in which every single application can start producing and and maintaining and preserving their own uh, big data. So what's next? We have a uh, crude. We all, all of us, grew up with uh, crude in mind. Create, read, update, delete fundamental operations on uh, relational tables. <clears throat> uh, now, next is uh, about rewriting replacing, evolving crude? Well, crude will stay crude, whatever it is today, whatever understanding you have of it will stay, but we have to add one extra dimension to crude, the dimension of history. So if I have to summarize crude today, this picture will be it. So has the, the nice cat sitting on top of the cactus shows uh, it can be quite uh, uncomfortable at times but uh, on the other end if you have reasons to like it crude is not bad today it depends on the perspective so it depends on how comfortable uh, you feel yourself uh, on top of a cactus Crude, again, C for create, R for read, U for update, D for delete are fundamental operations we perform on data entities. And uh, I know that the term entity is uh, essentially a generic term that, you know, generically describes uh, the structure of a real world concept we are trying to model with software. So if our software is about accounting, we have entities like the invoice or the product or the customer, the order item and things like that. Uh, for many years, uh, whatever we have been able to build around uh, the generic concept of a data entity uh, worked enough uh, to let us express uh, the business logic of applications. But uh, the future essentially is uh, more and more about uh, having and dealing with uh, much more sophisticated data models and uh, to fully represent uh, uh, realistic uh, business domains. So it's the amount of complexity that we face every day and we will face more and more in the near future that makes uh, the concept of a data entity, so a flat collection of properties, uh, attributes, uh, uh, not really, uh, not really uh, powerful enough uh, to, to um, model what we want. So we need something more sophisticated than entities, something that is called, often called aggregates. Now the term aggregate comes from a methodology called domain-driven design and domain-driven design is no rocket science, is nothing fancy, it has nothing to do directly at least, with uh, any framework uh, for uh, data access, it has nothing to do with uh, data access at all, I would say, because domain-driven design is just what the name says it is, uh, design of the software driven by the characteristics of the domain. And uh, to help achieving this goal, domain-driven design uh, introduces uh, the concept of an aggregate which is a superset 
of the concept, the familiar concept of a data entity that everyone dealing with, uh, having dealt with uh, uh, relational tables knows very well. So we can consider an aggregate to be a superset of an entity uh, and uh, which operations we perform on aggregates. So on entities we do create, read, update and delete operations. We do essentially the same operations on aggregates but except that uh, the creation, the update, the deletion, the read, the fundamental operations uh, uh, take uh, the form of business operations rather than um, database oriented operations. Again, CRUD create. Now, if we stop for a moment uh, and, and try to forget everything we know about uh, databases uh, and we think what it could mean to create a new instance of an aggregate of a business entity. Creating is uh, what? Is an operation subject to the application logic, I would say. Why application logic? Uh, uh, the application logic is, uh, uh, again, according to the DDD, Domain Driven Design Vision, is the part of business logic uh, where we orchestrate uh, workflows. So if we create uh, an invoice, for example, we are creating the invoice as part of a business process. We don't create the invoice uh, because, uh, uh, be, be, because it is. We create the invoice at the end of a workflow. We perform an update as part of a business workflow. <clears throat> So, in other words, uh, in an e-commerce system, when we do the checkout, which is a business operation, in the context of that, we trigger a workflow and in the execution of this business workflow, some operations on a variety of entities might be performed. We might create a new invoice record, we might update uh, a product state, order, and so forth. So. The creation is usually something that is driven by the application logic, so by the set of the use cases uh, the, our software, our application is called to implement and support. What about updates and, uh, and the deletions? I'm tempted to say that those two operations are instead subject to domain logic. Now, domain-driven design uh, introduces uh, uh, something called uh, uh, the layered architecture. So, uh, the recommendation for uh, we, we get from domain-driven design as far as a software architecture is concerned is that every software we write, every microservice uh, we write is uh, structured in horizontal layers, in four horizontal layers, a presentation, application, domain, and uh, infrastructure. Uh, those are more or less the same layers uh, uh, we knew for uh, 20 years at least uh, uh, and called the three-tier architecture, presentation, business, and data access. Presentation is the same in DDD, the layered architecture of DDD, the business logic has been split in uh, two layers, application logic, so the orchestration, the workflow logic, the application logic, and um, domain logic, which is the part of business logic that is invariant to use cases and invariant to whatever front end that we may offer. So when we update or delete an entity we work on, we are probably doing that driven by the strict business logic. The business logic that doesn't depend on the user action, but it depends on the internal 
intricate, possibly intricate uh, uh, connections uh, and relations between entities. So update and delete are for the most part uh, driven by domain logic. The read part of the R of crude is instead subject to presentation logic. And this is a, a crucial concept because it indicates uh, neatly and clearly that the way in which we store data, especially today, is uh, or should be treated as completely different from the way in which we read and present it to users. Okay, now, to cut a long story short and to try to move more and more uh, in the nearby of databases, all this to say that we probably should consider more and more some sort of custom ad hoc API for updates and deletions uh, that is uh, soft. What is a soft update? It's a, essentially a standard update operation that in some way preserves the old state. So I'm making a change to this record, but I'm making the change in some way that the old value is still there somewhere. Uh, analogously, a soft delete uh, is uh, an update. So it's not a deletion, it's not an operation through which we remove records, we remove physically information from a table, but is a logical deletion in which we just mark the record has, this doesn't exist anymore, even though it's still there physically. So soft updates and soft deletes are, deletions are, for the most part, uh, uh, custom ways uh, to do updates and deletes that is not directly invoking uh, the uh, related uh, T SQL SQL commands. For example, I mean the, the soft delete is relatively simple to implement and pretty common. You just add to the table that contains deletable records an extra column, boolean column, and you mark that true false uh, depending on whether the record has to be considered from the business logic uh, uh, has deleted or valid. A soft update is a, a little trickier because uh, probably it requires uh, that you maintain a parallel uh, body table where you store multiple copies of the same ID of the same records identified with its primary key for every you know, state that he had during the lifetime of the application. Of course, this uh, additional historical uh, table, this log audit table, are all log audit, are all uh, uh, synonyms uh, for, for the core idea that I'm trying to, uh, to convey in this uh, context, uh, essentially it's about having a, a parallel table that only grows in which records are appended constantly and never deleted from. Because every deletion in that case uh, re indicates that some information is being lost. Now, custom API for soft updates and soft deletions. Uh, um, Historically, this uh, way of using a custom API, this way of creating this custom APIs uh, has become so popular and so common that at some point, well, back in 2011, it made its way into the ANSI SQL standard. So in other words, is since the ANSI SQL 2011 standards that uh, DBMS that are compliant with that standard are required to offer through an API historical data management. So in other words, there should be, there is a standard ANSI SQL way to implement soft updates and soft deletions. Now, in the SQL Server world, soft updates and uh, uh, soft deletions uh, essentially never happened until uh, SQL Server 2016. In uh, SQL uh, 2016, we have, uh, as you can see, probably from the screen, uh, there is a 
a screenshot uh, taken from the Object Explorer in uh, Management Studio. There is a dbo.bookings uh, table here uh, that has uh, uh, the extra command in the name system version and the child of this bookings table there is another bookings history table with a command in parentheses that says history so essentially we have uh, we can have in SQL Server 2016 something that is technically called a temporal table now a temporal table differs from a regular table uh, for uh, the part that for the fact that it has uh, it is two tables in one. You have the bookings table, for example, and if this table is marked to be temporal, it automatically appends a child table called history that automatically is populated with the old dismissed states of the records in the parent table. Now, if, uh, if uh, um, we right click in the tables node of a database in SQL Server uh, 2016 we have uh, uh, from uh, the UI as you can see here we have a new system version table so the UI way to create uh, a new table and of course the same can be done also programmatically that relationship between uh, the regular but temporal system version table and the child history table is a sort of a master slave. Um, the history table is entirely managed for the right part by the system, the SQL Server engine. Uh, developers uh, can only read the content of the history table and no records can be ever deleted from the history table in no way. Now, let's uh, learn a little bit more about uh, the system version tables, or to use uh, a fancy name, uh, temporal tables in SQL Server 2016 and uh, newer versions. Temporal tables, and you find at the bottom of the slide a uh, link uh, to the official Microsoft uh, uh, documentation. Uh, in particular, the, the link points to the page where some considerations and some limitations of temporal tables are illustrated. But in summary, the slide on screen now fundamentally summarizes uh, the key fact, essentially the, the, the cheat sheet of temporal tables. Now, first fact. The child history table is automatically created the moment in which you turn a regular table into a temporal table or in the moment in which a temporal table is created from scratch. The content of the child history table is read only for code, for development code, and no row in that table can ever be deleted. Historical data can be queried however so it's available in read but not in writing and you need to use ad hoc SQL commands essentially ad hoc SQL commands for querying historical data is a regular query command a regular select from table command except that it has a few extra clauses uh, that further restrict the chunk of rows to be returned. Uh, cascade operations are not supported if tables uh, are child in a foreign key relationship. However, this limitation is going to be dropped in SQL Server 2017. So this cascade limitation only applies to SQL Server 2016 uh, tables. You cannot drop a temporal table. Uh, so yes, it means exactly what it means. So if you turn a regular table into a temporal table, that table becomes undeletable. There is no way, no UI, no programmatic way to drop the table. Uh, if you physically want to drop that table, you have to first reset the state of the table, 
back to the normal state so you have to reset the temporal attribute and once the table has gone back to its regular state of a regular SQL table it can be dropped and this is uh, the T SQL code uh, for creating uh, a temporal table it's nothing special in yellow I just uh, highlighted uh, the specific extra uh, lines you need for uh, uh, temporal tables so the the DBO dot employee uh, table will has uh, will have uh, an employee ID uh, primary key cluster the name position department address annual salary regular uh, columns and then in yellow the extra part that makes uh, physically this table a temporal table there are as you can see a couple of date time to columns with uh, uh, extra clauses generated always as row start one and the other generated always as a row hand uh, the names of these two columns which is sys start time and sys end time in the demo those are arbitrary uh, names so you can change sys start time and sys end time to whatever you like but uh, logically um, those two columns uh, uh, represent uh, the start and end validity for the instance of the record and uh, to qualify those two records has the period of validity for the instance of record there is the third line period for system time so actually you are in the first two yellow lines you are just adding you are instructing the engine to add the two extra columns and then period for system time so the period of validity of the system validity for the instance of the record is determined by the interval sys start time sys end time or whatever names you have chosen for the row start and row hand columns uh, this is uh, for the physical uh, creation of the table with uh, system versioning on is exactly where you turn you, you turn on the flag that instructs the SQL Server 16 and newer uh, to treat that table as a temporal table. Uh, history table equals is where you specify the name of the child of the body history table that goes with the employee table. So in, when this line executes, we're going to have a new employee table with a child uh, employee history table uh, that is treated as uh, the uh, audit log table for whatever uh, changes are performed programmatically and through UI on the content of the parent employee table. <clears throat> this is uh, what you get, what you see once uh, you run that code in uh, Management Studio, for example. Date time columns. Uh, uh, can be null, cannot contain null values, but can be arbitrarily named. So you are responsible for the names uh, that the columns, the date columns have in the table. They must be marked as generated always as a row, start and end. Managing those columns is entirely reserved to the system. The history table cannot have uh, um, cannot have uh, a primary key, but it can be created programmatically. So you you can essentially create the history table uh, programmatically, and this happens the moment in which you programmatically turn on the flag that makes a table a temporal table now the default history tables so if uh, the table uh, is uh, created uh, through the UI of SQL Management Studio it is automatically given a clustered index 
on date time columns. Um, the same happens if you run a SQL command to do that. But you can also, and if we go back to the previous, uh, to the uh, previous, uh, um, to the previous uh, slide, we see it. So, in other words, uh, if we run this line, this code here, and the employee history doesn't exist, it's being created and it's given automatically by default a clustered index. But you can even essentially create the employee history table as a regular table and just attach an, that has an existing table to uh, a temporal table. If you do that, so if the table already exists and you are creating that yourself, then it is highly recommended that this uh, custom history table has anyway a clustered index essentially for query performance and compression purposes. And this is uh, the line that um, resets a temporal table to the state, the status of a regular table. So, Alter table DBO employee set system versioning off. On and off are the commands that essentially turn on and off the status of the table has temporal or not. When you turn a system versioning on, you also have to specify the name of the history table to be created or to be just linked. In summary, a history table is um, a copy of the main table plus a couple of date time two columns. And those two date time columns indicate the validity period for that particular state of the record. In other words, the history table, which as mentioned has the same structure, the same schema has the main table plus a couple of date time columns, contains multiple copies of the records in the main table, one entry, one record per each state of a record found of an existing record in the main table. So for every record in the main table, we have a history table, possibly multiple records, one for each different state the record had since the time it was first created. And uh, the two date time columns uh, just indicate the starting time and the end time of validity for that particular state of the record. So valid from or sys start time, whatever the name you choose, indicates when the record got that given state and the other column, valid to or sys end time, if we use the naming of the previous slides, indicates when the validity of that state ceased to be valid. Updates and deletes are database operations that cause the values in those columns to change and those are the operations, the, the database operations that cause new records to be appended automatically in the history table. You, you do nothing to append a new record in history table. Uh, the append of a new record in the history table happens, has a consequence of running in whatever way is possible an update or a delete statement on the main table. So in other words, uh, this is a screenshot that shows uh, the <clears throat> that shows uh, the effect of um, an update uh, statement, uh, update a bookings table where we set uh, uh, Howard to uh, thirteen for an ID of two, and uh, essentially the first uh, uh, list of records shows. Uh, the content of the main table where we have a record with an ID of one that has now uh, an hour, this represents a booking for the corner room starting at 13 for uh, one hour, owner of the reservation is uh, Dino. This is, the, this is what we get when we do select star from bookings where ID equals true. But if we do instead select a star from bookings history 
where ID equals true, we get two records. And in particular, we see, we, 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 we know from the second select star query, we learn that in the full history of the bookings table, record with an ID of two went through two past states. So he has the current state, but before he went into the current state, he went through two other states. And in particular, the first state uh, he went through uh, was the state in which the booking for the corner room was initially entered to be to start at nine, uh, to be one hour, and the owner was someone called Joe, and this state of the booking ID equals true, this state was valid from uh, uh, for, for about 10 minutes, uh, from the 22, 4 minutes up to 22, 14 minutes of the uh, 27 of September. Uh, then, and then you see that the value of sys and time in the first record matches uh, the start time of the second state. So at that point, at 22 hours, 14 minutes, 33 seconds of the 29th of September 2017, at that point, an, a change was made in the record and uh, the change was that the owner shifted from Joe to Dino and uh, the state of the record, corner room, booked at 9 for one hour by Dino, that was the case up for, for, a, over, for about a minute from 22.14 uh, minutes to 22.15 minutes. At that point, another change was made which produced, produced the current state we observe for the record that says, okay, the hour was changed, the, the booking started at 13 rather than 9, the length was still one hour, the room still the same, the owner still the same, motivation still null. Okay, so this is fundamentally uh, the mechanics uh, of uh, uh, temporal data, how they work in uh, in SQL Server. Okay, now uh, let me switch briefly to um, Management Studio so that we can observe uh, uh, the same uh, uh, changes that I briefly showed uh, through slides live in Management Studio. And then I want to show you a little bit of code that discusses uh, how we can try to make uh, this uh, temporal tables uh, work uh, with uh, entity framework. Uh, uh, the bad news is that essentially we have no support uh, for temporal tables from uh, entity framework. Uh, it's not there. There are some things you can do with entity framework, but for the most part, uh, it won't work. So the most interesting things uh, you might want to do uh, through Entity Framework uh, won't work if the underlying table is a temporal table. Uh, at some point, uh, things will change, uh, but neither Entity Framework 6.x uh, nor Entity Framework Core 2.0 at the moment support temporal tables. Um, so this is uh, now uh, Management uh, uh, Studio. And uh, here I have uh, here I have um, the current state uh, of the table. So this is the booking table that has a few a few records. So let's uh, take one particular uh, record here. Let me see if I can easily zoom uh, this. Okay. So let's focus on uh, this. Uh, this record that has the ID of four. Okay, so let's focus on this record um, and try to edit this so that, for example, the owner is no longer uh, Joe, but it, it becomes another user. But before I, I do that, I want to show you that the output of this select here, select star from uh, table and we also want to query sys start time and sys end time and I'm querying, uh, I'm querying uh, bookings, uh, bookings history. Uh, if I essentially 
limit this query to to uh, the the records uh, where uh, ID equals four, we find only one record. Nice. Now let's go back here. Let's change this from Joe to Dino. And I just in place edited the record. I go back here. I refresh. And oops, I refresh the query, and I find now two records. I find two records, and the last records that was had, this one, um, started getting into into um, into value at now. So. Um, 1949 so a few seconds ago and so this record in which the owner is Joe is no longer valid and because effectively now the this record has another owner which is Dino so essentially every time you we make a change on a record uh, another value is appended in uh, history table and this happens in a way that is completely totally uh, outside our control is entirely managed by SQL Server okay um, now what about entity framework um, entity framework in entity framework usually uh, we work uh, with uh, code first uh, code first is not the default way of working uh, in um, regular non core uh, .net uh, is uh, instead uh, the only way of working with entity framework uh, in uh, if we use uh, uh, a core a .net core uh, application um, but code first uh, entails uh, that you can have an API through which you can create uh, um, a table. So let's uh, explore ways in which we can create uh, directly through Entity Framework code first a temporal table. And uh, now in this uh, in this uh, application, I have uh, a bookings. Uh, uh, database uh, uh, DB context and all I do here is adding a custom uh, database initializer and this initializer well quite simply has uh, hard-coded a SQL statement that alters uh, a table uh, with a name and adds uh, sys start time and sys end time and gives uh, them default values uh, and then essentially in the seed method of the initializer, so where the database is physically created and populated, uh, I first check that the version of SQL Server is uh, at least SQL Server 2016, which uh, requires the version number of 13. And if the version of SQL Server supports temporal table, I just execute this statement. Uh, the string here is a format string that is then uh, completed with uh, uh, the name of the table and the history table is uh, booking so whatever followed by the history uh, suffix so actually I just execute the command the SQL command to create a temporal table so uh, there is nothing really special uh, it's just a plain use uh, of SQL commands uh, uh, if we want to use entity framework code first uh, uh, to create a table. It is uh, a lot more uh, intricate uh, trying to read, to query uh, records uh, uh, using entity framework. Now, uh, let me give you an example of the application in uh, up and running. Uh, this is the same application live if I click on the view uh, button 
I have a list of records and this is just a plain query done on the bookings uh, table uh, in the in the we have seen uh, uh, in Management Studio and as you can see we have here the record number with ID of 4 uh, that has uh, uh, a owner to be Dino exactly as I made my changes uh, earlier. And then what you, what you see now is that the, I, I just uh, clicked on the, on the record, I was too fast so let me repeat it, uh, go back. So if I click on this record, I see the history of booking in number four. The history till midnight of today. And I see the list of changes uh, in red, I see the current history of the record, so the current state of the record in red, and then in gray I have the list of changes in the descending order, so this is the first state, this is the next state and so forth, so we can observe that the record was initially created to be a booking on the 24th of October, starting at 3 p.m. for one hour, name of Joe, and this was entered the uh, uh, 17 of October. Then, uh, about an hour before I started this presentation, the record was updated to be two hours long, and there was the time of I made the changes. And then, this is the the change that started uh, a few minutes ago that determined the final record. So, to cut a long story short. Uh, uh, a concrete benefit you can take out of temporal tables is uh, easily track the history of every single record you have in your database. But just to reinforce the point, let me uh, stop the application and let me edit briefly uh, the code. This is an ASP.NET MVC sample application and uh, this is the method I call to get the history and uh, there is a, a date time uh, value here that sets the time limit I want to know the history for. So let's say that I want to ask the state of the, oops, I have to stop the application first. Let's say that I want to know the state of the records up until yesterday. Here we go. <clears throat> application happened running and <clears throat> and okay stupid JavaScript continue okay here we go view here we go um, record number four, I click, <sighs> continue again, uh, and I only get this. So I see the state uh, of the record, the state that was entered uh, the 17th of October, because uh, we had three changes made to record number four, but two of those changes have been made today. And uh, now this is the history of the record till November 7, midnight. So this is the state of the record at a particular moment in time. This is the power of temporal tables, concrete power of temporal tables. Okay, uh, back to PowerPoint for uh, finalizing. Uh, the, the story. Uh, now, temporal tables, it's an all or nothing kind of thing. So either you can track the history of the entire set of columns or nothing. At the moment, there is no way to uh, filter out things. The cascade limitation that I mentioned, so cascading operations are not supported in 16, but it will be supported in 17 and newer. If you have a blob columns, size-wise it can be a little bit problematic. Uh, concretely, 
if you want to work with uh, a temporal table, you have to do that using plain SQL commands, which makes it pretty cool to use uh, with uh, uh, micro or RMs like Dapper, for example, much less enticing, well, not working at all, let me concrete, uh, uh, if you use Entity Framework. Uh, there is another feature of Entity Framework, another issue of Entity Framework uh, that I haven't mentioned that, uh, and showed in code, but concretely it is the following. Um, essentially, when you make a, a query with a Entity Framework, uh, you can uh, essentially hook up the generation of the SQL command for Entity Framework and uh, at that point you can extend the command to add the, the time interval for the records you want to get. So to, in such a way you can ca capture the history of things. The query, the, the new, the modified SQL uh, works beautifully, can be run and interestingly when you capture the list of records the funny thing is that Entity Framework uh, is not really running the query. Entity Framework, uh, for performance reasons, uh, uses something called Identity Map so that it internally maintains a cache of previously retrieved records. So if the record and the record is, ent is identified by ID is already in memory, it's not being retrieved. So. In other words, if you go this way, if you perform the smart trick of updating on the fly the SQL uh, being generated by Entity Framework, actually the query never hits the database because of the identity map of Entity Framework. So you get the right number of records, except that because all records have an ID of four, a primary key of four, you get three times the copy of the current state instead of the actual history of the record. Uh, this is because Entity Frameworks at the moment is, uh, and this happens to Entity Framework 6 in the full .NET Framework and Entity Framework Core, even version 2, those two versions are completely unaware of temporal tables. So in other words, if you want uh, to use, integrate temporal tables with Entity Framework, uh, you have uh, essentially two ways. Use uh, micro or RMs or plain ADO.NET code or in Entity Framework Core, uh, you can try using a uh, high queryable uh, that essentially uh, allows you to combine together the output with uh, uh, queryable strings, but it doesn't work uh, essentially if you want to get the history of the record. So everything works, but the history of records, so give me the history of this record from time to time, that particular aspect won't work. So you can run queries on the main table, but not on the history table. So, so in other words, temporal tables in EF core are essentially useless, and the only reasonable way of working with temporal tables is through micro or RMs. Now, the title of this presentation also has a business level events or something like that. It's about the difference between entities and aggregates. Entities raise events like updated, deleted, and created. And those events are being tracked automatically, free for you, from the engine of SQL Server 16 and 17. Uh, not always this is necessary enough for applications because if you have a real aggregate, so cluster of entities that are the granular entity element you work with in your applications, you need the events which is not as simple as updated or deleted on a table record but is an update or a delete global operation that may involve multiple records in multiple tables. This is the difference between a, a table level events and application level events. Uh, event sourcing is uh, an architectural pattern that addresses the point of tracking uh, uh, application level events. But temporal tables are a basic way 
to or a first step towards event sourcing. But event sourcing is something too wide, too complex to be easily summarized in one hour. So temporal tables is a, a good step, a nice step towards the future of software development, but for the time being is still crude. Uh, final comment, history tables uh, don't include indexes, statistics, triggers, permissions, so the size is kept to a bare uh, minimum of data. Uh, there, there is also, and the documentation here shows uh, uh, more details, uh, how to try to optimize the temporal tables so that uh, current data are in memory and historical data is uh, uh, this based uh, so that the, the performance of the machine can be improved to some extent. Uh, there are memory optimized and durability uh, attributes uh, the documentation explains how to use to optimize uh, this version of uh, the, um, the temporal tables. Uh, and uh, again, temporal tables are a nice thing, but uh, are just the first step towards even sourcing. Even sourcing captures all changes to an application state as a sequence of business events, not necessarily data table events. State uh, transitions are an important part of the problem space and should be modeled within our domain. And these two things are the challenge for the future of, of applications and uh, uh, has a plain uh, data access uh, tool, uh, uh, temporal tables are there to help. And this is uh, everything that I have to mention about uh, these topics. The link on Dropbox uh, shows uh, uh, the zip file from where you can grab a copy of the uh, bookings demo that I just showed. Okay, I'm done and uh, all that I can say is uh, thank you for uh, for being here um, and just hope that you, you enjoyed um, the presentation. Yeah, thank you so much Dino, really interesting topic, uh, absolutely. Uh, just let me see if anyone has some questions for you, but you've been really, really, you know, clear and, and simple in your explanation. So let's see. Anyone has a question? But anyway, feel free to drop an email, dino.esposito.gelbrains.com. It's pretty easy to remember. Just yeah. uh, feel free to drop an email. Yeah, okay, so that's it. Uh, thank you very much, and I hope to host you again soon, maybe in 2018. Well, why not? Thank you, David, yeah. for, uh, for inviting me, and thank you guys for attending. Thank you, bye-bye. Bye-bye.